Good afternoon aspirants. Welcome to Shankar Summary 2024. These are the important quality current affairs topics of this year and these topics are most likely to appear in prelims 2024. So make use of it. Now let us get into the discussion. For the first topic let us take curative petition. This curative petition recently appeared in news regarding a supreme court judgment on Delhi Metro Rail Corporation. Now look at this question. Let us understand about curative petition through this prelims practice question. Three statements are given and we have to choose the correct statement. Before solving this question, let us discuss a few important information about curative petition. See, curative petition is the last option available to approach the judiciary after exhausting all the appeals and dismissal of review petition. So this rare remedy evolved by Constitution Bench of Supreme Court in 2002 in Ashok Hura vs. Rupa Hura case. The main objective of curative petition is to avoid the miscarriage of justice and to prevent the abuse of process. See a curative petition is supported by article 137. As per article 137, in the matters of law and regulations made under article 145, the Supreme Court has power to review any judgments or order made by it. So this is about the basics of curative petition. With this basic understanding, now let us look into the procedure of curative petition. See, a curative petition need to be made within 30 days from the date of judgment passed. Remember, a petitioner can file a curative petition only if the review petition has been dismissed. The petitioner must also state or assert specifically the grounds for the review petition and that it was dismissed by circulation which must be certified by a senior advocate. Now let us see who can hear a curative petition. See, a curative petition is heard by a bench of three senior most judges including the Chief Justice of India plus the same combination of judges who delivered the original order. The curative petition is also entertained on very narrow grounds like a review petition and the dismissal rate of curative petition is also very high. See, if the petition is filed without any merit, the court may impose fine on the petitioner. So with this knowledge, let us take up our question. The first statement says that it is originally mentioned in Indian constitution under article 137. This statement is obviously incorrect. The curative petition is not originally mentioned in constitution. It is derived from Ashok Hura vs. Rupa Hura case and it is supported by article 137. So it is not originally mentioned in article 137. And look at the second and third statements. These statements are correct. So the correct answer for this question is option C, 2 and 3 only. Now let us look at the election symbols. How election symbols are allocated to different parties? See, this was recently in news because there were many issues regarding allocation of election symbols and many parties are appealing about the election symbol allocation. See, Election Commission of India is responsible for allocating symbols to political parties and it follows the guidelines laid out in Election Symbols Reservation and Allotment Order 1968. So, this order aims to regulate the symbol specification, reservation, an allotment during elections. See, there are two types of election symbols. One is a reserved election symbol and free symbol. The reserved election symbols are exclusively assigned to recognized political parties and the free symbols can be chosen by unrecognized registered parties. The recognized national and state parties are granted exclusive symbols which signify their established status. See, the election symbols were introduced to facilitate voting by illiterate people who can't read the name of party while casting their votes. In 1960s, it was proposed that regulation, reservation and allotment of election symbols should be done through a law of parliament that is symbol order. In response to this proposal, the Election Commission of India stated that the recognition of political parties is supervised by the provision of election symbol order 1968. So the allotment of election symbols will also be followed by this order. The election commission registers political parties for the purpose of elections and grants them recognition as national or state parties on the basis of their poll performance. So the other parties are simply declared as registered unrecognized parties. The recognition determines their right to certain privileges like allocation of party symbols, provision of time for political broadcast on television and radio station, and access to electoral rolls. So with this basic understanding, now let us see the current issue regarding the election symbol allocation. See the rule 10b of symbols order provides that the concessions of common free symbol will be available to 
registered unrecognized parties for two general election after the two general election it will be eligible for a common symbol only if it has secured at least 1% of votes polled in the state moreover such unrecognized party should however apply for a symbol every time in the prescribed format the application can be made any time during the period of 6 months prior to the lok sabha elections and also note that the symbols are allotted on the first come first served basis so this is about the rule 10b of symbols order which is recently in news so this is all about the discussion now let us move to the next topic now let us learn about the forest conservation amendment act recently central government reduced many amendments in forest conservation act so let us learn about them first let's take a look at forest conservation act of 1980 see this act was enacted to prevent large scale deforestation it provides some restrictions on diverting forest land for non forest purposes The recent amendment bill tries to include and exclude certain types of land from the scope of the act. Let's see the important features of this act by comparing with the original act of 1980. The act says that two types of land will be excluded from the provisions of the act. Firstly, the land recorded as forest before October 25, 1980 but not notified as forest. Secondly, the land changed from forest use to non-forest use before December 12, 1996. The amendment also allows the forest land within 100 kilometers of India's border to be used for security or strategic purposes. The original act of 1980 allows only certain non-forest activities to be carried out in forest land like establishing checkpost fencing and bridges. But the amendment act permit zoo safaris and ecotourism facilities in forest land. But the bill says that the state government must acquire prior approval even for government organizations. So these are the highlights of recent amendments made in Forest Conservation Act. Now let us see what are the issues with this act. As the new amendment proposes to exclude certain types of land from the protection given by the act, they become vulnerable to exploitation. So this provision may go against 1996 Supreme Court judgment in Goda Vaman case. The judgment provided protection to vast area of forest against deforestation. and the amendment tries to dilute the judgment of supreme court the new amendments also restricts the power of state government to classify the forest land allowing the projects like zoo ecotourism facility may also affect forest land and wildlife in the sensitive regions so this is about the forest conservation amendment act of 2023 with this let us move to the next topic now let us learn about the contempt of court So recently the Madras High Court has initiated suya moto contempt of court proceedings against Greater Chennai Corporation. So in this context let us learn about the contempt of court. See when someone is said to be in contempt of court it means he has disrespected the court's order or lowered the authority of court. The objective behind the concept of contempt of court is to safeguard the interest of public because if the authority of court is lowered then the public confidence in the administration of justice will be weakened. So the concept of contempt of court is necessary for the judiciary to function smoothly. See there are two types of contempt of court. One is civil contempt and another is criminal contempt. First let us take up the civil contempt. A civil contempt means willful disobedience to any judgment, decree or direction of court. So this is about the civil contempt. A criminal contempt means publication of any matter or any other act which scandalizes the court or lowers the authority of court. So basically the difference between civil contempt and criminal contempt is that in case of civil contempt the order of the court is not followed while in case of criminal contempt the authority of the court is lowered having understood the basics now let us see the constitutional provisions regarding contempt of court first is article 129 it states that the supreme court as a court of record have the powers for contempt of court it means it has power to punish for its contempt of itself with regards to high court We have Article 215. This article declares High Court as a court of record, and it shall have the powers to punish for the contempt of itself. So, Article 215 is related to High Court, and Article 129 is related to Supreme Court contempt of court. In addition to this, we also have statutory provision under Contempt of Court Act 1971. There is also Article 142, Class 2, which mentions the contempt of court. So, if you notice carefully. Article 129, Article 142, Class 2, and Article 215 mentions the contempt of court, but nowhere they define the term concept of contempt of court. We can say that the Constitution of India does not define contempt of court. So this contempt of court is defined in the Contempt of Court Act 1971. So this is all about the discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. 
See, recently there was a controversy regarding the appointment process of election commissioners. The central government has passed Chief Election Commissioner and Other Election Commissioners Act 2023. Last year, Supreme Court has passed a judgment regarding the appointment of election commissioners. According to Supreme Court order, the election commissioners must be appointed by President on the advice of a selection committee. And this selection committee must include Prime Minister, Leader of Opposition Lok Sabha and Chief Justice of India. But the central government has introduced this Chief Election Commission and Other Election Commissions Act 2023 and this act has countered the judgment of Supreme Court. This new act has replaced the Chief Justice of India with the Cabinet Minister on the Selection Committee. So basically now the Selection Committee includes Prime Minister, a Cabinet Minister and Leader of Opposition. So the Chief Justice of India was removed from the Selection Committee to Appointment of Election Commissioners. So this act has given the central government a dominant role in the appointment process of election commissioners. Also note that the recommendations of selection committee will be valid even when there is a vacancy in this committee. Now looking at the constitutional provisions, there are five articles in part 15 of the constitution which is related to the appointment of election commissioners. But it does not lay down any specific legislative process for the appointment of election commissioners. The articles from 324 to 329 deal with the election commission. So this is all about the discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Here we are going to learn about the Jan Vishwas Act 2023 which was recently passed by the parliament. The aim of the act is to give a boost to ease of living and ease of doing business. This Jan Vishwas Act amounts 42 laws across multiple sectors including agriculture, environment, media and publication. The provisions in Indian Post Office Act of 1898, Environment Protection Act of 1986, Information Technology Act of 2000 are all amended through the single act. The act converts several fines to penalties, meaning that court prosecution is not necessary to administer such punishments. It also removes the imprisonment as punishment for many offences. And note that all offences under Post Office Act of 1898 are being removed. The main objective of this Jan Vishwas Act is to decriminalize minor offences that do not involve any harm to public interest or national interest. The bill also provides for the appointment of adjudicating officers to decide the penalties. In addition to that, it also specifies the appellate mechanism for this adjudication. So this is the basic information about Jan Vishwas Act. Now we shall see the concerns regarding this act. See, even though the act was introduced with the aim of improving ease of doing business, it has largely transferred the power to impose monetary penalties from judiciary to bureaucracy. According to the act, the designated bureaucrats now have the authority to impose fines and order compensation for the offences under different laws. Additionally, the forest officers are also granted the authority to conduct inquiries and order compensation for damage to forest. So this has transferred the power of imposing penalties from judiciary to bureaucracy and it can undermine the constitutional principle of separation of powers. So this basically go hence the article 50 of the constitution. The critics also raise concerns about the appointment of adjudicating officers and the technical competence of adjudicating officers. So this is all about the Jan Vishwas Act. Now let us move to the next topic. See recently the Supreme Court of India invoked article 142 to overturn the results of elections for mayor of Chandigarh Municipal Corporation. So this situation illustrates how court uses its extraordinary powers under article 142 to deliver complete justice in respective matters. So let us go through article 142 for our prelims exam. Firstly note that article 142 provides a unique power to supreme court to do complete justice between the parties where at times the law or statute may not provide a remedy. In other words, if the existing legal framework is insufficient to address the particular issue or if there are any gaps in the law that need to be filled to achieve justice, the court can step in and make decisions for that particular case. It is like a discretionary power of Supreme Court. This unique power includes issuing orders, passing decrees or taking any other actions. Also remember that if any order passed under Article 142, it will be enforceable throughout the territory of India. And know that in 1998, the Supreme Court clarified that Article 142 should be used only to complement the existing law and not to replace them. So the court cannot create entirely new rules or ignore the rights of people involved in the case. See this article 142 empowers the Supreme Court to take necessary actions only to ensure justice in situations where the existing law may not be sufficient. 
So it actually works as a system of checks and balance with the government or legislature. This article was related to several important cases. For example, the Bobal gas tragedy case, the Babri Masjid demolition case, liquor sale ban case, etc. Even though the Article 142 confers curative powers, their broad scope has led to criticism. For example, the term complete justice is not defined in the constitution. Secondly, unlike legislature and executive, the judiciary cannot be held accountable for its actions. So the powers conferred under Article 142 could violate the principle of separation of powers. So this is about Article 142. Now let us move to the next topic. Recently, the Ministry of Home Affairs has extended the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in parts of Arunachal Pradesh and Nagaland for another six months. So in this background, let us learn about the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. This act gives unfettered powers to armed forces and to the Central Armed Police Forces which are deployed in disturbed areas. It gives a power to kill anyone in contravention of law and arrest and search any premises without a warrant. This law first came into effect in 1958 to deal with the uprising of Nagas. The act was amended in 1972 and the powers to declare an area as a disturbed area was conferred concurrently upon central government and the states. Tiripura revoked this act in 2015 and Meghalaya was under AFSWA Act for 27 years until it was revoked in 2018. Currently, this act was applied in some parts of Assam, Nagaland, Manipur and Arunachal Pradesh. So this is about AFSWA Act. Now let us move to the next topic. Here we are going to learn about the Places of Worship Act. Last year, this act was in news regarding the Ayodhya case. The Places of Worship Act was implemented in 1991 and it states that any place of worship of particular religious character as it existed on 15th August 1947 should not be changed into another religious character. So basically the religious character of any place of worship should not be changed and it, sh and it should remain as it existed on 15th August 1947. So this is the basics of this act. But there was exception to this act and it was given to the disputed site at Ayodhya. The exception was also given to any monuments covered under Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act of 1958. So this is about the Places of Worship Act 1991. Now let us move to the next topic. See recently Quality Council of India has completed 25 years of its existence. So let us learn the basics of Quality Council of India. It was established as a national body for accreditation in 1996 and it was set up through public-private partnership model as an independent autonomous organization with the support of government of India and Indian industries represented by three premier industry associations. They were Asocha, Confederation of Indian Industry and FICCA. See, Quality Council of India is a non-profit organization which is registered under Societies Registration Act of 1860. It functions under Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Now let us see the composition of Quality Council of India. It is governed by a council of 38 members with the equal representation of government, industry and consumers. The chairman of Quality Council of India is appointed by Prime Minister. The important objective of this Quality Council of India is to create a mechanism for independent third party assessment of products, services and processes. So it plays a vital role at national level in propagating and adoption of quality standards in all important spheres like education, health care, environment protection social sectors, infrastructure sectors, etc. So this is about the Quality Council of India. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankara Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.